program. Uh, it's always a great time when we come together to explore the Word of God, so as to grow together as believers, and also to shine the light of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to those see outside the gate. For the Bible says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And guess what? And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are very few that find it. I pray you will stay on that narrow path, and not join the multitude who think the word of God is of no effect in their lives. And if you are watching me today, and you are still having fun on that broad way that leads to eternal death, I hope you will consider your way, changing that way to that way of life, so that you can live eternally with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Before we go into today's topic, let us have a word of prayer. Father Lord, we thank you, we bless you, we worship you. We glorify you for it's another day to share your word with your people. Father, I pray for those who already know you, that you will use this word that will come out this morning, the sermon that will preach this day, to stir them up and make them to come higher in relationship with you. And for those who are here to learn you, who are still outside the gate, Father, I pray you will shine the light of the gospel upon their heart this day, that their lives will be turned around for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are going into a topic that also comes with a question mark. And this one is a big question mark. Uh, it goes this way Where will you spend your eternity? The question again. Where will you spend your eternity? Our Bible reading for this day is taken from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, starting from verse 1 to verse 8. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we are the building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this we groan. Honestly, designed to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being bodied, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit, us, has given the Spirit to us as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, we are pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Well, before I go on, uh, I'll quickly give a background to this uh, Bible passage so that we understand why Apostle Paul wrote this letter, the second letter. This was taken from... Uh, uh, the second letter to the Corinthians. During this time, apparently Apostle Paul had planted a church at Corinth, and that was done 
uh, there about uh, during his uh, second missionary journey. I did this uh, at Ephesus. He wrote this letter. This letter could have been uh, taken to be the third letter because uh, there was a missing one. There was a letter that was lost. Now, these letters, especially the second letter that we now call Second Corinthians, was actually written to address the situation of the issues going on in the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth has gone wanton. Word has crept into the church. Wolves has, have gone, gone into the church. The church was now behaving like the world. Sexual immoralities, all sorts of things were going on. And the children of God were allowing this to continue. And Apostle Paul got a report of what was going on in the church. And he had to address this. And the pinnacle of it all was the fact that the children of God were being deceived by some false doctrines, especially a doctrine that denied the resurrection, thereby denying the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know the resurrection is one of the greatest tenets of Christianity. If the devil could sell these to people in the church, apparently the devil could tell them, you have no reason for being saved. You have no reason to be in the church. So this was a very hot issue. And Apostle Paul urgently rose up to the occasion. That is the background to that Bible passage. Now, I'd like us to just uh, go a bit into understanding what the Apostle was saying to the believers at Corinth. Uh, we have to just have this in mind that this was addressed to believers, not to unbelievers. So everything I read out, you should know, was actually addressing the situation with believers a church in Corinth. The body we live in, going deeper now, we ought to know it's not a permanent home. The first thing it started with, those who trust in Jesus for their lives have a heavenly home. And indeed, their spirit yearn honestly to be there. If they're tired of God, you be a witness with that. Sometimes you will say, Come, Lord Jesus. Why are you saying that your spirit is young? Because you look around, and I'm talking if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will know that everything we have today that we have to enjoy, as good as many of them may be, they are nothing compared to the joy you feel within yourself, the joy that, that flows from the bottom of your heart when you think of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, God has not asked us to put our trust in this temporary home we, come, we call body. Though we have responsibility to take care of our body because this body is expected to help us to do and accomplish what God has called us to do. So we cannot be negligent of taking care of the body. That is very important. But the truth of the matter is, God has called us to place our hearts on something higher, something more lasting, something heavenly. That is the home we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you the expression of uh, Apostle Paul here. Reflecting on this very uh, first part of the passage, he said in Galatians chapter 2, uh, yes, verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer high that live, but Christ will live through me. And he said, the life that I live in the flesh today, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that tell us? We live the life that we live as Christians. We live this life by faith. I mean, the life we live in the flesh. And when we talk talking about the life we live in the flesh, it's talking about this tent, this earthly suit, where our spirit, our soul resides. He said, he lived our lives 
by that life by faith in the Son of God, talking about Lord Jesus Christ, who loved him and gave his life for him. And the same thing I can say of myself today. The life I live in the flesh today, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That is my heart cry that I look up to heaven, that I don't dwell as my soul is spreading this earthly suit. I don't dwell in there all the time because I know my home is heaven. And I believe for every Christian, every believer watching me, the same is the story for you in Jesus' name. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing what was going on in the mind of the disciples, in the book of John, chapter 14, from verse 1 to 4, Jesus says something to them, saying, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me also. For in my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have said so. I go and prepare a place for, for you. And if I go and prepare a place of, for you, I will come and take you to myself. And when I do that, bring you to myself, that where I am, you may know also the way you will know. That was the promise of Jesus Christ. And the promise remains today. That if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back. I take you to myself that you may know where I am and the way you will know. You will know where I go. You will know the way. That is Jesus Christ talking. I sing this to assure the believers, to let them know. I know you've grown in that earthly suit. I know you are not too comfortable in it because I know my spirit is in you. And don't worry. The home is, is being prepared for you. And if I go now, I'm coming back for sure to get you to myself so that you know the way. You know where I am. And you go wherever I go. What a promise, believers. What a promise. And I pray those watching me this day who are here to give their lives to Jesus, they will consider. Because this that we have, talking about a promise, is great. It is. Let me go further to the second part of it. Those who trust in Jesus Christ, they have expectation of permanent and secure hope in which sin and death shall not have power anymore. Hallelujah. Also, I take a Bible reading from uh, the book of Romans, chapter 7. I'll read from verse 21 to 25. This was also Apostle Paul speaking. He said this. This is talking about how we have a permanent home in heaven. He was reflecting on it as well, so that people would not mistake his mission. That his priority was not in anything that people might be looking at on the physical level. His priority was placed somewhere heavenly that they know. Even everything he was doing in the flesh, he had his focus in heaven. I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who wish to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see that I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? See how he finished it. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God all the time. But with the flesh, the law of sin. The long and short of what you say here is, thank God for Jesus was delivered in from the law of sin and death to live according to the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. That is no longer bound to that body. Earthly suit that we call body is no longer bound to live according to the dictates of the body anymore. That the flesh may do 
sometimes what the flesh wants to do. But guess what? He knows where his priority uh, was. His priority was to serve the Lord with all his heart. The same thing for us. So as believers this day, I believe we are yearning. We are yearning for that day when we see the Lord face to face. That doesn't make us suicidal in any way. It's just making us to see that there's something bigger and much better than whatever we can enjoy right now. It's a hope. It's a hope that is so great. And we, look, we all look forward to that. The mortal body we are in is decaying by the second. We call it aging. Though through, though we have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, but guess what? Sin, death, and even hell, to the glory of God, they cannot have power over us anymore. But the truth of the matter is, we still live in the body. We still live in this body that is decaying by the day. And as much as some people like to glorify this body, I have a great news for you. The great news is, if you are a child of God, you have something much better to look forward to. Do not be deceived. This body is decaying by the day. That's why you see people, they fall sick. People will say, I don't even know how I'm feeling today. The truth of the matter is, ever since the heart was caused for Adam's uh, cause, after disobedience, in the garden, everything has been in a state of entropy, like the chemists will call it, decaying by the day, a state of instability. And starting with humans, nothing seems to be stable, including our very own body that we like to cherish. Thank God we have the responsibility to take care of this home while we are here. But the truth of the matter is, this is not our home. Our home is in heaven. Hallelujah. Our home is in heaven. Going further, the expectation of this immortality is a promise from God Almighty Himself, who has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of security for the life that we live in the body until the day we are taken home. I'll come and explain that again. Can't you see how marvelous and wonderful God is? When He gave us a new life, or when a, 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 a person receives Jesus as Lord and Savior, we know, like the Bible says, the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. When this gift is given, it's a guarantee, it's a security that look, you are secure until you see my, my face in glory. God is awesome, God is good for believers listening to me this morning, watching, I want you to be assured of the security that you have. The person of the Holy Spirit, the top person of, this, of the Trinity, who is God himself, is residing inside of you as a security until you are safely delivered to God as his own child when you are redeemed eventually, when you get out of this body and you take on the glorious body. Hallelujah. That is very profound. It is profound. I take a reading from Ephesians chapter 1. I read verses 13 and 14. See, this is the word of the Lord. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you can see, we are here, we live by faith, but we have the hope. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Nothing can take that money away from us. So we have something glorious to look up to. Wait for that. Followers of Jesus Christ, they live by faith. Understanding the truth, they're here. It's not our home. They know they have to live here to do the work that has been prepared for them to do even before the foundation of the world. Having come to Jesus Christ, we are God's workman or workmanship. 
created through Jesus Christ to do the work that was prepared for us in advance to walk in. So we are not just believers who come into Jesus and then we are, we are jobless or we are hiding. No, we are created for good works, the Bible says. And as we do this good work by the day, going by the good works we have been called to do every day, we know one thing, that our home is in heaven. And we are not in any way confused where our priority is. Hallelujah. This is very important for us to always think about that. That we know we are here, we have heaven to look up to. Apostle Paul also in Philippians chapter 1, I read verse 21 to 25, says, For to me, to live is Christ. This is for further buttressing the earlier point I was making. That we live here, but we know this is not our home. He said, for me to live is Christ. That is, as long as I live, I live for Jesus. And to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. So it's hard pressed. Can you see? For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful. He was talking to, to, to his fellow Christians now. I'm being confident of this. I know that I shall remain and continue with you. All for your progress and joy of faith. I believe as believers, we always need to know this. That while we have been called to preach the gospel, to be a witness of the Lord, what he has done in our lives, we also know, we look inward, and we say to ourselves, we know this world is not ours. Even as we live to enjoy everyday life. Because while we are here, we are never to be useless. We are to do to the maximum what we have been called to do. But guess what? We have something higher to look up to. And may the Lord be blessed for that. May the Lord be blessed always. So that when we see all the frustrations going on, we don't say, oh, is that hard? We don't say, well, is it worth living for? We know we have something greater to look forward to. Hallelujah. Now, I'll be going to uh, a portion of this sermon where I'm going to challenge us to look at some basic truths of this Bible passage we're using today. And I'm saying this to especially believers. I want us to consider some, some great truths taken from this uh, Bible passage. The very first one is this. Do you know you are a spirit being living in a tent called body? I've said this before. But I'm asking this question again. Do you know that actually that body you are in now, and when people see you, they call you by your name. That's not you. You are just residing in that body. Do you know that? Because when we know that, always, there is this thing that comes up in our hearts to want to do what is right. Knowing fully well that indeed we are spirit beings. We are not to reduce ourselves to the level of flesh. Do you know that? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it said, As, And the, God, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. That's the word of God. So that's the you is the spirit of God. You is your soul living in that body. You want to realize that. Another one I want to ask you, do you know your body will die? Like we've been saying, I've been saying, saying this body is decaying by the day and eventually it will fall off and our, our soul will escape for Christians to go be with Jesus. And the challenge is for those who have not made up their mind yet to come into relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We are do you think your soul will go? Where do you think you will go? When eventually this body of sin, eventually, when it falls and your spirit, your soul has to escape, where do you go? Now another question, do you know the choice for your soul's eternal home 
is limited to two. Heaven or hell. There's a hope for those people who have made the choice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know home for them is heaven. But unfortunately for those who have decided against this, hell is the place for those people who are listening to me who have not made that decision. This is not for the believers. I'm challenging you this morning. Think about it. Think about it. Do you honestly think, do you honestly think that all there is to life is to be born, go to school, or learn a trade, or a vocation, marry, have kids, travel all over the world, and wait for the time to exit? Do you think that's all there is to life? Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you're thinking? If that is what you are thinking, with all due respect, that's a very low thinking. It is very low. Because you can imagine, if somebody lives only for that, and that person has worked all his life, and God forbid, something happens just like that, the person dies, without actually enjoying everything the person has been working for. And you want to tell me that's what life should be about? What we see happening around us, both believers and non-believers, they pass, they die. That should tell us here is a temporary place. It grieves us when we see a loved one, a believer especially, die. We say, oh, this person will, how we wish this person will live. But guess what? Eventually, the Lord says that person will come home to be with him. The person will die. As human beings, we're emotional. This will touch us, we will, we will cry over that situation, we will mourn. That's our nature. But the truth of the matter is, the Bible admonishes us never to mourn like those who have no hope. So we know the truth. That the truth of the matter is, that individual who is the believer has gone on to be with the Lord. But for unbelievers, the story is different. The story is different. And I hear all this uh, cliche, even when a non-believer dies this day, you hear people say, he or she has gone to a better place. And I wonder, which better place? You're talking of somebody going to hell? Going to a better place? That's the worst place in reality. That better place is only for Christians. Those who have given their lives to Jesus. And who live their life for him. That's the promise. It's not for, the, it's not for those people who refuse Jesus. That's not for them. I'll take another reading from... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I read from verse 16 to 19. See what Apostle Paul was saying here. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ has no reason. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then also those who are falling asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. What he's saying, the reasoning here is, is <clears throat> if we live this life, living for Christ, and it's just for this life that we see, it's so useless. But thank God, thank God, that's not why we are Christians. We are not Christians because we want to live as Christians here on earth. No, that's not why we are Christians. Actually, when Jesus said in John 10, 10 that the, the state comes to steal, <coughs> kill, and destroy, that have come to give them life and life more abundantly. The abundant life Jesus is talking about, hear me out, is talking about life eternal. That is the real life. It's, I give them life, they shall not perish. That is what he's talking about. It's not talking about the life people always put their heart on here. People want to live, they will say they are living an abundant life because of material possessions and things they have around them. I got a news for you. It doesn't matter what you've got. It's just in a split second like this. The moment you close your eyes, actually before you die, let me be honest with you. Have you worked in a day and you are so tired? And before you know what's happening, you fall asleep. 
I want you to take a cue from that. You have no idea what's around you anymore until you wake up. All those possessions you've been dreaming about, I'm telling you, you can't even have a dream. You can't even remember any because you're so tired. You don't see them until maybe somebody wakes you up or you wake up yourself. Then you begin to see those, those things again. Let's learn from all these things. That is telling you all these things are very, very temporary. Don't put your heart there. Put your heart where it should belong. Hallelujah. Do you know? And this question I always like to challenge people who are yet to know Jesus. I always tell them, do you know? It's not your sins that you are as bad, as terrible as your sins are now. Those are not the things that will actually take you to hell. And some of them will say, okay, what else will take me to hell? I said, look, what will take you to hell is your refusal to let Jesus wash your sins. Because the word of God says, if you come to him, he will take you. And your sins will be forgiven. So that tells me, what will take you to hell, what will take you to hell? It's not actually your sins. As horrible as your sins are, it's your refusal to give your life to Jesus. And then they will say, ah, that's, that's something. I, I've not even thought it like that. And I'll say, oh, yeah, you better know. You better know. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it says, all are sin and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, I believe that's as simple as A, B, C. That is saying, everybody has sinned, and everybody falls short of God's glory. So, if I say to you, how dare that you're looking at me this day, and you have not given your life to Jesus, if I tell you, it's not your sin of homosexuality, your sin of uh, adultery, your sin of uh, stealing, your sin of as horrible as they are, the only thing in those sins, they will surely take you to hell if you don't come under the blood of Jesus. That's what the Bible says. But if you come under the blood of Jesus, those sins have no power over you anymore. So that will tell you, it's not, it's, it's not what eventually will take you to hell. It's not those sins. It's you refusing to receive the great free gift of salvation. The free gift of salvation that has been given to everyone that will come, the Bible says, whosoever shall come shall be saved. If you refuse it, that is to your own detriment. And those sins, they will weigh heavily on you. That is when the sting of sins remain on you. If you don't allow him to take that sting away. The blood of Jesus washes it away and the sins are gone. But if you refuse, it's your own decision, unfortunately. The Bible says, in John chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. Hear me. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come to the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. That's so clear. That is the condemnation. The condemnation, what takes people to hell, is refusing to bow their heads to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says there is no salvation in any other. It's only in Christ Jesus. There is no salvation. In any other. The only name given among men under heaven to be saved is the name of Jesus Christ. And if you refuse that name to have effect upon your life, that's your decision, unfortunately. It's your decision. And you are going to bear the brunt of it, unfortunately. For believers, I have some lines for you here. I call it the believer's final victory. And I'm going to be reading this from the book of 1 Corinthians as well, from uh, verse 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right, uh, sorry. I will read uh, from verse 50 to 57. That's 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 50 to 57. I want you to hear me out. And this is what I call 
believe us by now victory. It goes. Now this I say, this was the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthians. Brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That is talking, some people will be raptured. But at the end of the day, we will change. In a moment, in the twinkling of an heart, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Talking about those who have died knowing the Lord. They will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. O death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? Your sting is gone. Where is your sting? It's, no, it's, no, it's nowhere to be found anymore. O age, where is your victory? Your victory is gone. You don't have any victory over us. The sting of death is sin. We know that. Yes. The sting of death is sin. If somebody's sin is not wiped off by Jesus' blood, that sting remains. That is when the death has power over any life. And thank God that the sting is removed from the lives of believers. And the Bible says, the strength of sin is the law. We know. We got to know about sins through the law. And because nobody can keep the law, that's why God sent his only begotten son. Who came and lived the perfect life? That is keeping the law. He's the only one ever who did that. And he lived this life to give us eternal life. So we have no excuse. You have no excuse if you are watching me this morning and you are still outside the gate. I implore you, for those who refuse the free gift of salvation, the sting of death remains. They will die second death which is eternal by nature. Their sins remain, and they cannot live with the only God of heaven for of eternity. They face what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment. That is what they face, unfortunately, for those who have refused. They will not enjoy that victory song that I just sang for, for the believers. They can't say it. They can't say it. They can't say, oh, death, where is your sting? They can't say that, unfortunately. But this is what the Bible says. is their hand. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, from verse 11 to 15. It breaks my heart to read this all the time because I know it is not the heart of God for anyone, anybody, born of a woman, to go to hell. Hell was not created for mankind. It was created for Satan and his cronies. But people are making that choice every day to go with Satan outside. He had it. The Bible says the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Talking about unbelievers this time. Because believers are gone. They are no longer here. And death and AIDS delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and AIDS were cast into the lake of fire. This is called the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works 
by the things which were written in the books. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the heart and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Well, before I hand up this sermon, I want to once again challenge you. If you are listening to me, and you are still hardening your heart, you are still having it your own way. I pray you don't die a sudden death. Because if somebody dies suddenly, that's it. No more chance. That you are still living today, I'm telling you the truth, is another statement for you to know that Jesus loves you. Satan will have loved you to die without knowing Jesus. Because Satan knows you will go to hell. But the fact that you are still living today is an opportunity for you to reconsider your way. Turn from that way that leads to hell. Come to the way that leads to life. Moses, the great leader in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 19, he has this to say to the congregation of the Israelites when he was running up things for them. He had to go over everything he had spoken to them. And he made some heartfelt statement to them. He said, I have said before you, life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. In other words, Moses warned his congregation that if they choose life, he warned, he warned them that if they chose life, they will have blessing. But if they decided otherwise, cursing, eternal death will be their portion. I pray that will not be your portion today in the name of Jesus. I pray as you are listening to me this day, that the light of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, reaching out to your heart, will do that which is supposed to do, to mix with faith in you, and then you begin to think about who you are. For the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that the Lord and that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. That's a promise. For with your heart, with your very heart, you believe unto righteousness. And with your mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And the, the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. That's a promise you can, you can take with you anytime. For there is no distinction between Jews and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who will call upon him. And the Bible says, whosoever Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. As I round up, a link is coming on the screen. I want to implore you to go there. If you want to give your life to Jesus, we have explained this, all the things I've been saying. We have put it in simple words for you to understand. I believe God will make with you there, even as we make that decision today. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. Father, we bless you. Thank you for giving us life and life more abundantly. That we do not only have life here, but we even have that which is far better to look forward to. We bless your holy name. We glorify you. And Lord, I pray for those who are making up their minds this day to want to have relationship with you so that they can have that life. Father, I pray nothing will stop them in the name of Jesus. And together, we will reign with you for all of eternity. In Jesus' name, we we'll pray. And I will see you next time on this program, Harvest Feast. God bless you.